Good evening. How are we doing? We can do better than that. How are we doing? There we go, guys. Welcome to Living Oaks Church and, and Get a Grip. This is our third of six nights, and we are in for a treat. Uh, my name, if you don't know me, is Jonathan Noyes. I'm a pastor here on staff. I'm also a co-host of Apologetics.com Radio, uh, who's helping us sponsor, and uh, they're live streaming. A special shout out to the OC Cigar Club right now that's watching us live, and uh, they are live, the holy smokes, and uh, we praise you for them. And, uh, and also this evening, it's a privilege to be here serving as a, a type of moderator for the discussion, I'm hoping that this is the most you hear from me, though. Uh, so tonight, our goal is is to be witness to a conversation between two people. So I'd ask just a few things of us as the audience. And the first is let's keep all the applause for the ends because these two gentlemen, they spent a lot of time preparing for this dialogue back and forth. We wanna let them have the stage and we can glean knowledge from what they're saying. Uh, the second, let's not speak out of turn. I don't think I need to say that. If I do, you know, we've got tons of security here that would be happy to wrestle you to the ground in the midst of everybody else and how embarrassed. No, just, you know, keep the comments uh, to yourself until the question and answer period, and we'd appreciate that as well. Uh, you know, our time together is going to begin with a 20-minute opening statement from each of our participants. From there, we're going to roll into almost 40 minutes of dialogue back and forth. And then we're going to dismiss you parents to go pick up your kids. Don't leave them here. We don't want them anymore. <laughs> so you're going to pick up your kids, and then we're going to roll into a question and answer for about 30 minutes. And one thing to remember, Kaylee, could you put that text number on the screen for me? We're doing all our questions via text tonight. So this is the number. Also, if you, are, uh, if you, if you got a booklet, that number is on the inside of the booklet, and we're going to remind that of you. All of you live streaming, you can text as well, 805 552 6136 to get your questions in. Uh, following the Q&A, we're going to have just a three-minute summation by each of our participants as well. Uh, before you leave, though, before you leave, you guys have an assignment. Make sure you fill out your evaluation, but not only your evaluation. Make sure you fill out the little CAD that you had on your seat when you came in here. That's really, really important. Please do that, and as you leave, uh, drop them in the brown baskets. We've got one basket there and one basket there in the lobby right outside the exits, because uh, we, we do look at those things. So, you know, tonight's discussion, it's, it's not a debate, but instead it's a dialogue between two men who have a mutual respect for one another while disagreeing greatly on a very important topic, a topic that's at the pinnacle of the cultural conversation today. And while, no, this isn't a debate, there is a resolve. You see, tonight we'll be in pursuit of a biblical and theologically rich answer to the question, what does the Bible teach about homosexuality? And it's this question that we must allow to serve as our guide this evening. We took great care in choosing our guests for tonight's discussion. Both of these men are accomplished writers and sought after speakers. Both are winsome in their apologetic, knowledgeable about the topic at hand and gifted rhetorically. Both are kind and respectful men. Both would say that there, there's, a, there's a concern or a care they share for one another. And they also have a share, they, can, they, they share a concern for the bride of Christ, they'd say. These two men have gotten to know each other over the past few years, and I would say that you guys would say you're friends, you know, and I'd, I'd like to include myself in there as well. So I think that we yeah, find each other quickly. Now, uh, we, so, so I'm looking forward to a friendly, good dialogue on a, a topic that can often produce a lot of heat and not much light. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to this. Matthew Vines is, is the founder and e executive director of the Reformation Project, through which he hopes to equip and empower Christians to advocate for LGBTQ inclusion in their faith communities. He's also the author of God and the Gay Christian, the biblical case in support of same-sex relationships. In that book, he makes the case for Christian affirmation of gay Christians in their marriage relationships. Matthew is considered a leading gay Christian voice today and has been featured in publications like the New York Times and the Huffington Post. And it's a pleasure to have him here this evening. Sean McDowell is a professor at Talbot School of Theology at Biola University. Woo! Who likes Biola? Yeah! You know, he's, he's authored a number of books and articles, including Same-Sex Marriage, A Thoughtful Approach to God's Design for Marriage. 
He has a passion for equipping the church, especially the youth, to defend the claims of the Christian worldview out in the marketplace of ideas. But most importantly, Sean is a dedicated husband of 17 years, and he's a father of three. Please, can we welcome Sean McDowell and Matthew Vines. <laughs> and now before we hear their presentation, allow me just to offer a few tips, if I can. I like to think of tonight in terms of surgery. You see, both Sean and Matthew would agree that there's something wrong with the body of Christ. Both tonight are going to diagnose the problem as they see it, and then offer to us a plan of treatment, a surgery, if you will, to remedy this illness. And that's where we come in as the audience, guys. That's where we come in. It's our job tonight to listen to these two men and discern which not only has the proper diagnosis, but also the proper treatment. So how do we do this? Well, as your pastor, most of you here go to Living Oaks Church. As your pastor, I'm going to try to offer you just a few guiding principles. First, allow me to point out that, it, it, that this isn't a, a both and situation, but rather an either or. You see, if Matthew is correct in his position, then Sean is wrong in his position. And the reverse is true as well. If Sean is correct in his position, then Matthew is wrong. And in such an instance, a change of mind ought to occur. But let's not let that scare us away from landing on a treatment plan. Just because these two intellectually astute gentlemen disagree doesn't mean that we have to find our comfort in some gray area. Please, a warning to you, resist the temptation to throw your hands up tonight and say whatever. This issue is simply too important. We can discern a proper diagnosis and a remedy. And how do we do that? Well, great question. You know, we've been given tools. Just like a surgeon has been given tools, so too have we. You know, before a surgeon, before she performs surgery, she goes to school and she's given a scalpel and she's taught how to wield that scalpel. Well, likewise, we've gone to school. We go to church every single Sunday. Well, some of us. Every single Sunday, right? And we've also been given a scalpel, the very word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, sharper than any scalpel that we could ever be given. You know, and, and tonight, these are the tools that we must use in answering the question, what does the Bible teach about homosexuality? Now notice what, what we ought not use in determining who the better surgeon is. We don't choose a surgeon who's the, who's the nicest or the most winsome or who has the best hair, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awful. Uh, you know, we, we, so so we, we don't choose based on emotion. You know, no matter how well-intentioned or nice somebody can be, we can be led astray. Just ask my wife how nice people cannot be right. It happens often in my house. This is, this is <laughs> it does, I'm wrong most of the time. This is about what the Bible says, guys. Not, not how nice or well-spoken or how, in, to quote Zoolander, how incredibly good-looking somebody is, you know. Thank God again. You know, but tonight's conversation, I'm about to conclude here, tonight's conversation, it's also not about how, how to best minister to same-sex attracted folks. Or it's not how, to, how best to, to approach our children who struggle with being gay or lesbian. These are pastoral questions and they're important questions. But tonight, we have to lay a groundwork so to answer those pastoral questions by seeing what the scriptures have to say about homosexuality. What do they teach? Also, tonight is not about love versus hate. I think both of our participants would agree to that. But it's about truth. You know, after all, Paul wrote, love rejoices in what? Truth. That's right. And, and both of our speakers tonight, they believe their viewpoint is uh, the most loving response. I think they'd agree to that as well. Tonight's about being faithful to the scriptures, though. And let us not confuse, this is important, so hear me, let us not confuse disagreement with animus. I've asked Sean and Matthew here intentionally, it's not by accident that these two men are on stage, I've asked them to present their case on this topic, and I expect them to be passionate about that. I expect them to bring their best case tonight. See, when disagreements happen, it's a, it's a beautiful thing, because through disagreements come clarity, and it's through the clarity that we can discern 
truth. So tonight, I would charge us with listening as these two reason from the scriptures for the position. After all, it's the scriptures that are the standard of truth, not our emotions or, or how we even feel about the topic at hand this evening. Ask yourself, who's giving the best biblical arguments tonight? So put on your thinking caps, friends. Pull up your socks and stay awake because I can't think of a more important topic to discuss or two better men to be discussing it this evening. Welcome to Get a Grip. What does the Bible teach about homosexuality? Dr. McDowell, your 20 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, John. Well, good evening. My thanks to Pastor John for hosting this conversation and my respect to Matthew for being willing to come to a church and dialogue on an issue, a church that holds a historic Christian view on sex and marriage. I appreciate John's opening statement. This issue is too important to be decided by personality, experience, or likability. Don't be tempted to believe something because you like me or my Justice League shirt or because you don't like me. (laughs) And the same for Matthew. The ultimate question we must keep asking is what does God say about same-sex relationships? We must carefully discern the truth. To address this issue more specifically, I'm going to focus on the life and teachings of Jesus. Here's the specific question I'm going to ask. What is the view of human sexuality that Jesus believed, lived, and proclaimed? Before I lay out my case, please allow me four qualifiers. First, my assumption is that the sexual ethic Jesus taught is what would bring true human flourishing in life and relationships. In John 10.10, Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. God's commands are for our good. We may not fully understand them, just like children don't fully understand the good directives their parents give them, but his commands are always for our good. David said, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. And his final speech to the Israelites before they entered the promised land. Moses said, And now, O Israel, what does the Lord God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Imagine a world in which everyone followed God's design for sex and marriage. There would be no sexually transmitted diseases no abortions, no brokenness from divorce. Every child would have a father and a mother and experience the love and acceptance each parent uniquely offers. There would be no rape, no sex abuse, no sex trafficking, no pornography, and no need for a Me Too campaign. Think of the healing and wholeness that people simply live Jesus' life-giving words regarding human sexuality. This is why I don't embrace the term non-affirming to describe my own view. I am affirming of Jesus' view. Jesus knows what is best for mankind. I affirm that Jesus knew what he was talking about and had good reasons for it. Thus, I prefer the phrase Jesus' view to describe my own. The view that God designed sex for the one flesh marital union of a man and a woman and the term revisionist for the position, which Matthew embraces, that God blesses some same-sex unions. Two of the leading revisionist scholars use the term, so I think I'm on solid ground. My second qualifier is to remind us that Jesus is for the marginalized. Jesus healed the sick. He cared for the poor. He loved those on the margins, even when when he took flack for it. It was Jesus who told the story of the prodigal son, which illustrates God's unending love and compassion for his children. And Jesus gave us the ethic of the Good Samaritan, which reminds us to love and care for the least among us. Jesus gave us the greatest moral teaching of all time. And yet, Jesus' love for the marginalized never made him overlook or minimize their sin or their need to turn from it. Though Jesus absolutely loved their souls, he never tolerated their sin. Jesus loved the broken, which involved caring for them personally and calling them to repentance. In that sense, even the Pharisees were marginalized. Jesus came to the marginal of every class, calling sinners of all kinds to repentance. Whether rich or poor, powerful or weak, Jesus always responded to the repentant sinner, who came to him for forgiveness by caring for them and by saying, go and sin no more. And regardless of personal status, his message was the same for all. Whatever far land you've gone off to, return to the Father who loves you. My third qualification is this. 
Even as a single person, Jesus was fully content. He was not married, and he never engaged in a single sex act. Think about that. Yet he experienced profound contentment, joy, and peace with his sexuality as an adult single male. Humans can live without sex and marriage, but we weren't designed to live without love and intimacy, and there's a big difference. My fourth and last qualification is this. Christians have separated the teachings of Jesus from his humanity. We have turned the good news of God's plan for sex into a set of moral rules. Yet we need to remember that Jesus was a real human being with flesh and blood. He didn't merely look like a man. He was and is a full human being like us. Yes, he was God, but he was also man, a male. Tempted in every way as we were, and yet without sin. God could have revealed his divine nature in a number of ways, but he chose to become a man, entered the world through a woman, the Virgin Mary. Through the incarnation, God fully embraced male and female sexuality. You see, in the incarnation, God affirms the male gender and he affirms the female gender. As the Apostle Paul said, Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made for man, so man is now born of woman. Through the incarnation, Jesus affirmed that human beings are essentially male and female and interdependent for existence and survival. With these four qualifications in mind, let's look at Jesus' teaching on God's life-giving design for human sexuality. Matthew said that this next point is the most persuasive for people to embrace the revisionist viewpoint on sex and marriage. It's also the opening chapter in his book. It's an argument based on the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Let's first read the two verses. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Matthew writes, Jesus' test is simple. If something bears bad fruit, it cannot be a good tree. And if something bears good fruit, it cannot be a bad tree. He's exactly right. But the question is, what did Jesus mean by fruit? And this is where Matthew errs in a costly way. He interprets fruit as the experience people have in living out Christian teaching. Matthew says, quote, today we are still responsible for testing our beliefs in light of their outcomes, end quote. And the test, according to Matthew, of historic Christian teaching about sex and marriage is that mandatory celibacy for gay Christians, quote, produces bad fruit in many of their lives, and for some it fuels despair to the point of suicide. In other words, it is the historic teaching itself that is responsible for the pain and hurt experienced by many LGBT folks. That's why later in the book, Matthew says, so it isn't gay Christians who are sinning against God by entering into monogamous loving relationships. It is the church that is sinning against them by rejecting their intimate relationships. And then he adds this. This kind of love and affirmation, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, is in fact a requirement of Christian faithfulness. In other words, Matthew believes that if you hold the historic Christian teaching, you hold beliefs towards gay relationships that have, quote, led to crippling depression, torment, suicide, and alienation from God and the church. You are sinning and an unfaithful Christian unless you change your theology to the revisionist view. Now, I have no animus towards Matthew for holding these views at all. I appreciate his candor and clarity. I appreciate that about you deeply. But this puts us at an impasse, as John said in the introduction. You see, he believes I am sinning and unfaithful for not adopting the revisionist viewpoint. Worse, and don't miss this, Matthew has to think that me and all other Christians who taught the view Jesus has held for 2,000 years were wolves in sheep clothing. I think Matthew is twisting the scriptures and importing a foreign narrative onto the Bible that Jesus would have rejected. The bottom line is this. Our views cannot be reconciled. Either he is right, and I am sinning and twisting God's word. Or if I am right, then he is twisting God's word by encouraging people to engage in sinful sexual behavior. There is no third option. So the key question here is this. What did Jesus mean by fruit? If we can only recognize a good tree by its fruit, we have to know what Jesus meant by the fruit. This is where the context is important. Here's what we know, and please hear this. 
Bad fruit is not the bad experiences people have when they are told to obey God. Jesus did not teach us to evaluate scriptural teachings and doctrine by the emotional effects they have on our lives, but on the moral effects they have on our lives. According to Jesus, bad fruit is sin, and good fruit is obedience. The next verse makes it clear that good fruit is following the teachings of Jesus. Right after this passage in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Earlier in the same gospel, four chapters earlier, John the Baptist was preaching repentance. And some Pharisees came to one of his baptisms. John said, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath of co to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And then he says the exact same thing for Matthew 7, the passage that Matthew quoted. Every tree that does not bear good fruit, meaning repentance, is cut down and thrown into the fire. In other words, according to John the Baptist, three chapters earlier, good fruit turning, is turning from sin and bad fruit is continuing in sin. The Apostle John confirms this understanding of the word fruit when he records Jesus as saying in John 15, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in me if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Jesus asks his disciples to bear much fruit, which means living obediently to his commands. Good fruit is obedience, bad fruit is disobedience. And the good fruit Jesus envisions includes the fruit of submitting to God's intentions for sexual expression. In Greek, there are two ways to express bad. The term both Jesus and John the Baptist chose in reference to fruit is poneros, which has the connotation of wicked or evil. Bad fruit really means immorality or immoral behavior. In other words, immoral behavior, not bad feelings. When we consider the context of Matthew 7, the other ways Jesus uses fruit, and the Greek term Jesus and John chose to use, bad fruit simply cannot mean the harmful consequences that result from following biblical teaching as Matthew wants you to believe. With that said, please hear me. There is a serious concern over the suffering of LGBT people. I mourn for those who suffer from depression, loneliness, and consider suicide. I have cried with many of my friends and students regarding much of the shame and pain they often feel. This is a pastoral issue the church must step up and address better because lives are at stake. Matthew, I think you can help the church a lot with pastoral sensitivity to the unique needs of LGBT people. But the way to do this is not to distort biblical teaching. For we must remember, it is only properly understood and applied words of Jesus that bring abundant life. And if we distort the words of Jesus, we prevent others from experiencing the abundant life as well. Now let's consider some specific teachings Jesus offered his view on sex and marriage. The passage is in Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. Jesus was asked about divorce, but he offers principles that apply to the question of same-sex unions since he grounds his answer in God's created order and purpose. Here's what he writes. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him, Jesus, by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife? and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Notice a couple things. First, when the Pharisees ask about the lawlessness of divorce, he points back to the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2. Jesus believed that what Moses wrote down earlier captured God's universal plan for sex and marriage which is why Jesus said, have you not read? Second, 
Jesus quotes both Genesis 1.27, he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and Genesis 2.24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now to answer the question of the permissibility of divorce, which of these two passages is the only one Jesus needed to cite? I think you know the answer. The answer is Genesis 2.24. So why did Jesus include Genesis 1, 27? It's as, as if Jesus is going out of his way to affirm that marriage is a permanent, gendered institution of one man and one woman who become one flesh for one lifetime. Now to fully understand what Jesus meant in this passage, we gotta take a closer look at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 1, 27 says, so God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. A passage you all know well. A few important things stand out from this. First, men and women are both made in the image of God and have infinite dignity and worth. Second, God made human beings into two kinds, male and female. Third, God blesses them and commands mankind to procreate and fill the earth. Now let's look at the second verse Jesus quoted in Genesis, now chapter 2, 23 to 24. It says, Then the man said, This is at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Don't miss this pattern here. The man leaves his father and mother, which indicates that the home is meant to be one man and one woman. And then he shall hold fast to his wife, which means the relationship is meant to be permanent, and they shall become one flesh. This new couple will begin their marital union, which will also be oriented towards filling and populating the earth through procreation. Matthew has a few responses to this common sense reading of the text, and since when I went first, I'm going to go ahead and include them right now. First, he says, but the account of Eve's creation doesn't emphasize Adam's need to procreate. It emphasizes his need for relationship. He also lacked any human friendship or community which have made, would have made his loneliness all the more profound, end quote. Notice how he inserts the word loneliness. The text never says Adam was lonely. It does say it was not good for him to be alone but it does not say he was lonely. Now with that said, I do agree that human beings are made for relationship, for community, and it's not good for man to be without community. But to claim that this text is primarily about companionship and not also procreation is a false dilemma. In Genesis one through two, Adam and Eve are given a blessing and a command to populate and fill the earth. Procreation, thus fulfilling the creation mandate, and to care for and cultivate the earth. To fulfill God's specific command to fill the earth, Eve needed to be a woman. Amen. Second, Matthew says, the text doesn't focus on the gender differences between Adam and Eve, rather it focuses on their similarity as human beings. The Genesis text focuses only on what these two have in common. In other words, it was humanity that mattered, not her gender. But this misses the full force of verse 18 which says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man shall be alone. I'll make a helper fit for him. Helper communicates that Adam was, Eve was a companion in completing the task God had given Adam, to work and keep the garden and to populate and fill the earth. Another man could only help him with the first task, but not the second. This is made clear with the Hebrew term for fit, or some translations say suitable. The word Hebrew is konegdo, which has been translated fit for him, but it literally means like his opposite. She is like Adam in that she is human, but she is different in him because she is female. According to the Hebrew professor Brian Peterson, God seems to be declaring that the man needs a helper that when standing in front of him is his opposite. That is why God built the woman with a perfect physical anatomy that would fit the man's anatomy when they stood in front of him. Like a right and left hand, they are the same but opposite. Matthew focuses merely on the similarity between Adam and Eve, but the text indicates that both similarity and difference are in view. 
When we consider both the Hebrew words and the context of Genesis 1 through 2, it's clear that the otherness in Eve is precisely her sexual difference and not her different strengths finder evaluation, to quote my friend Preston Sprinkle. Third, and my last point, Matthew says the one flesh union of Genesis 2.24 focuses on the familiar commonality, familial, two people share in forming a new kinship bond. In other words, sexual difference or complementarity is not part of the nature of the one flesh union. He cites Genesis 29.14 in which Laban, upon learning that Jacob was his relative, explained, surely you are my bone and flesh. Surely you are my bone and flesh. And likewise, David told the elders of Judah, you are my brothers, you are my bone and flesh. Matthew is right to consider the union of Adam and Eve a kinship union. They are starting a new family unit. But he's wrong to disregard sexual complementarity as part of that union. Two observations. If we dismiss sexual complementarity, then I wonder how Matthew limits a marital union to two people. On this reasoning, a polyamorous or polygamous union would count as one flesh. After all, in his own example, David referred to the elders of Judah, a group, as his own bone and flesh. Second, there's a difference. I'll wrap up. There's a difference between being of the same flesh and being one flesh. My daughter and I are of the same flesh, but only my wife and I are one flesh. The one flesh union of all is not only the sex act, sex act, but also oneness, a wholeness in all of its dimensions. Think about it. Individual beings can perform every biological function as individuals, respiration, digestion, and blood circulation. But there's one biological function where individuals each have half, reproduction. Male and female come together as one organism, one flesh, which is oriented towards procreation. Marriage is about much more than sex and procreation, but it is about no less. And this is why Jesus said, there's no need for marriage in heaven. He said in Luke, the sons of this age marry and are given in heaven, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Since a central purpose of God for marriage is procreation and people will not die in heaven, there's no need for marriage. My last point I'll just sum up is this. Jesus did not move in a more progressive direction on sex and marriage. He moved in a more conservative direction. When asked about divorce, he went tighter and firmer and more conservative than those of his day. When asked about adultery, he went more conservative and said it's not just an act, it's what you think. This is why N.T. Wright said, when we get to the New Testament, we might expect from the received assumption that we would move from a strict moral demand to a slackening of moral tension in the new. Not a bit of it. Jesus is very clear in Mark 10 and Matthew 19 that now that he is here launching God's kingdom, renewing the covenant between God and his people, the creation itself is being renewed. He goes back to the beginning to Genesis 1 and 2. God made the male and female and insisted that the two would become one. In conclusion, we will only experience true freedom when we understand and live the teachings of Jesus about sex and marriage. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Mr. Vines, uh, 20 minutes, and how, how, how far over did he go? Two and a half, so you have 22 and a half. All right. <laughs> Sean, thank you so much for sure. opening. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate Sean's respectfulness, his kindness, and his civility, civil discourse is possible, <laughs> contrary to popular opinion. Um, as Isaiah says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. And I think it's so important to have spaces like this where we actually create space to do that um, with a mutual respect, but also a conviction that can differ. So thank you so much as well to John and to Living Oaks for having me here and to all of you for deciding to spend your evening uh, listening to us and, and being here as well. I, I really appreciate it. Before I get started in talking about the Bible, which is one of my favorite subjects, I wanted to share a little bit about myself, who I am and my story, so that you have a little context for understanding why I believe what I believe and who I am. I was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas, in a very loving, stable Christian home and in a conservative evangelical Presbyterian church. I accepted Jesus into my heart at the age of three, and it's actually one of my very first memories. And ever since then, my faith in Christ has been and continues to be the most important part of my life. My relationship with God, my faith in Jesus, and my 
membership in the body of Christ are the things that are most important to me in the whole world. Uh, those are also the things that my parents were most keen on sharing with me and imparting to me. So it's no surprise then that I've always cared a lot about the Bible. The Bible has always been incredibly important to me and it remains very important to me. I, um, I used to agree with Sean and with Sean's position. Certainly that was the position that my church taught, although the topic really didn't come up that much when I was growing up. I think it's, it comes up more nowadays than it did when I was you know, 10 or 15. But by the time I was in high school, I started to meet for the first time gay people, or at least openly gay people. And I, so this eventually, you know, at first I just thought, well, we should be loving and kind to everybody regardless, even people we don't agree with. We should just be loving to everyone, which I still agree with. I think that's true. But as I began to develop deeper relationships with openly gay people, especially in my first year at college, I was very moved and grieved by the incredible pain and suffering that I saw in so many people's lives, in so many LGBT people's lives, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people, people who grew up in Christian homes, but who had been very poorly treated, who had been uh, brutally rejected by their family, by their churches, by their friends after coming out. And so for so many people who I was meeting, even people who weren't gay or bisexual or transgender, but just had friends who were, a lot of them had really negative views of Christianity because their experience of Christianity had been something, a weapon that was used to harm them or their friends on the margins. And I remember thinking, wow, that's, that's a reason why you should want to be a Christian because you have a heart for people who are hurting and for people who are marginalized. And that's what the teachings of Jesus are consistent with as well. And so I really think, so many friends are like, man, you'd be a great Christian. But unfortunately, everything they've experienced about Christianity told them that those values that I understood to be so central to the teachings of Jesus were actually values that were opposed to Christianity. And it wasn't just that people had a difficult time. Um, and of course, there's a difference too. Some people will say, well, a lot of people will be mean to LGBT people, and that's wrong. But the church's historic rejection of all same-sex relationships is not a serious contributing factor to the harm that LGBT people experience from the church. And certainly, people should be kind, and there have been you know, many terrible stories that only compound the trauma and the shame that people have experienced. But as I've come to understand it, the church's rejection, categorical rejection of all same-sex relationships has done and continues to do serious harm to the lives of LGBT people and LGBT Christians. It's not just that the teaching is difficult. We should all be willing to take up our cross and endure difficult things and endure suffering for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of Jesus. That is a part of being a Christian. So it's not just that it's hard for people. It's that even the most difficult suffering that we might have to endure as Christians is still something that should conform us more closely to the image of Christ within us. So the, the most significant example you could think of would be somebody who lays down their life for their friend. So that's a serious act of self-harm, but it's done out of sacrifice and it's done in a way that clearly emulates Jesus and God and that helps to show God's love to other people, even through that act of self-sacrifice. The difference with the harm that I experienced on this topic and the harm that I've seen on this topic is that the harm that LGBT people experience has not been something that conforms them more closely to the image of Christ. It, LGBT youth who are rejected by their families are 8.4 times more likely to attempt suicide than LGBT youth who are accepted by their families. The numbers for depression, drug abuse, and addiction are also much higher based on how people, based on whether people are accepted or not after coming out. And that is not the way things should be. That's not consistent with difficult Christian teachings. Difficult Christian teachings should not lead people to such a point of despair that they feel that their life has no value and is not worth living anymore. Something is off there. And for me, I had some, you know, I had some people saying, well, you know, I can tell that you really care about this and you care about your friends, and that's great. But ultimately, you know, your experience needs to be subordinated to the teaching of Scripture. And I agree with that. Scripture, ultimately, if we were just going by a judge of how we saw things and how we felt about things, uh, that's a pretty subjective grounding to 
decide our opinions based on and our beliefs based on. But I do think that experience plays a role sometimes in leading us back to the biblical text to look at it more closely. And as, as Sean talked about, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about false prophets and false teachers. And I, but I think that the principle that he offers is applicable to teachings as well, that a good tree will bear good fruit and a bad tree will bear bad fruit. And I don't think it's as subjective as a person's, you know, just somebody is having a hard go with something. I think we can look to biblical definitions of what is good fruit. Yes, it is obedience, but I also think it's things like what we find in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those were traits that I was seeing in many monogamous, committed, same-sex relationships. And those were not the result that I was seeing of the rejection that people experienced at the hands of the church. And that was inconsistent with every other Christian teaching, even very difficult ones that I had found. There was something about that that said, so for me, that's not my end point, but it is a point that says, I want to go back to the biblical texts. I want to look a little more closely at the six passages in scripture that have really formed a significant part, the basis of the church's rejection of same-sex relationships. This has happened before in church history, where experience can drive us back to scripture to want to look at scripture more deeply to make sure that we have the most accurate understanding of the Bible. 400 years ago, the telescope was invented. For the first 1,600 years of the church, every Christian leader and theologian believed not just that the earth was at the center of the universe, but that the Bible clearly taught that to be true. And there are biblical verses where it makes a lot of sense why people interpreted it that way. Psalm 93.1 says that the earth is fixed in place and it cannot be moved. Joshua 10 talks about how the sun stopped in the sky during a battle and then kept moving again. So a lot of people read this and said, well, obviously the sun is what's moving, not the earth. But Galileo came along with his telescope, looked through the telescope, suddenly could see things that Christians had not seen before, that no one had seen before, that showed that a geocentric worldview in which the earth is the center of the universe just couldn't be true anymore. And he said that scriptures were, were written about the, the sun, the moon, the stars. They were written in a way that made sense to those who would be reading it to the hearers. They were, so it's not so much that they were giving a lesson about astronomy, but they were talking about the sun, the moon, the stars based on how people here see things. And we still do this to this day, even though we all know that the sun is at the center of the solar system, we still talk about the sun rising and setting as though it's moving, even though we know that it's not. So no Christians today really have a problem with reading Psalm 93 or Joshua 10 and thinking, oh shoot, you know, we've got a problem here because the Bible clear, clearly teaches geocentrism. No, we understand that the lens for how we look at those passages changed once the telescope was invented. And it's not that the passages were wrong. We just needed to change our lens for looking at the passages. So that's similar to what I propose that we do when it comes to the topic of sexual orientation and same-sex relationships. The question of same-sex orientation, people who have an exclusive permanent attraction to members of the same sex is not a question that the church has addressed prior to the middle of the 20th century. In the past, Richard Hayes, he's a leading New Testament scholar who does not affirm same-sex relationships. And what he has written, he said that sexual orientation, quote, is a modern idea of which there is no trace either in the New Testament or in any other Jewish or Christian writings in the ancient world. The usual supposition of writers during the Hellenistic period was that homosexual behavior was the result of insatiable lust seeking novel and more challenging forms of self-gratification. A bishop named John Chrysostom in the fourth century of the church compared the drive to same-sex behavior to excessive hunger and thirst, and he said, quote, that it comes of an exorbitancy which endures not to abide within its proper limits. That's a great phrase. But the point that I'm making is that the way that sex sexual orientation, understanding it as a person is gay, not something that people chose and not something that people have the ability to simply flip a switch and change, that does not have a long history in the history of the church. The first Christian writing that acknowledges that gay people exist as such was a private correspondence written by C.S. Lewis in 1953. Prior to that, most references that you find in the early church fathers or in other even in the writings of the reformers, to same-sex behavior are normally, uh, the, normally not very long, kind of passing references 
that are assuming that it's a product of excessive lust, lust and desire run amok, rather than talking about we actually have you know, a gay person in our church and here's how they're experiencing, you know, and, and here's how this affects them. And one, so some people, for some, for some people, this has raised the question of, well, maybe sexual orientation really isn't such a permanent thing because this is an idea that has only recently come to be understood. But, and that's why ex-gay or reparative therapy organizations were pretty in vogue for a long time in the church. But in 2013, those were organizations that attempted through therapy and prayer to change gay people's sexual orientation, to change their attractions, to make it so they were not attracted to the same sex anymore, but attracted to the opposite sex. In 2013, the leading ex-gay organization, it was called Exodus International, they shut down. And their president, Alan Chambers, apologized for what he said was the false hope, the shame, and the trauma that their organization had caused. They had good intentions, but he realized that what they were doing did not work and was giving people a false hope that ultimately was even more harmful to them. He also said that 99.9% .9 of the people he had worked with failed in their attempts to change their sexual orientation, and two years later, he revised his number to 100%. So we know there are so many men and women who deeply love Christ, who tried for years and for decades to change their same-sex attraction. It did not work. God can do anything, but that clearly is not something that God is regularly in the business of doing. And that's important for us in how we're thinking through this conversation. So what that means, if in fact sexual orientation and same-sex orientation is a fixed, unchosen, unchanging characteristic of a small minority of the human population, then that has a serious consequence if all same-sex relationships are sinful, because that means that gay people need to be single and celibate for life. Uniquely as a class of people, not just as a heterosexual person who is unable to find a partner, therefore, is, you know, therefore should be single and celibate, but even if they find a partner who is suitable for them, someone they want to build a home and a family with, that is forever off limits to them. There is no other class of people in the church where there is that kind of celibacy mandate. Certainly in the Protestant Re Reformation, this was a significant point of contention because the reformers believed that the Catholic Church was imposing a celibacy mandate and they believed that this was clearly contrary to the teachings of scripture, to the teaching of Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, where he said, I wish that all were like me, but I recognize that each person has his own gift. Paul talks about celibacy as a gift. Jesus talks about celibacy as a gift in Matthew 19, when he raises the bar for divorce, as Sean talked about, and his disciples say, well, perhaps we shouldn't get married at all then. And Jesus says, well, that word of foregoing marriage can only be accepted by those to whom it is given. Both Jesus and Paul talk about celibacy as a gift. And what's interesting is the Catholic Church itself actually insists that they are not mandating celibacy because they say that celibacy is a requirement of the vocation of priesthood to which people are called, but that no one is forced into it. So even the Catholic Church, which has a different view than Protestants on this, on, about celibacy, still thinks it's very important to make clear that celibacy is not ever being mandated on a whole class of people without a choice and simply because of who they are. In this case, though, if all same-sex relationships are sinful categorically, then we need to mandate celibacy on all gay Christians on account of who they are, which would be an innovation in the history of the Christian tradition. That is not something that has been done before, and it's not something that has borne good fruit in people's lives. So, those were several reasons that to me kind of raised red flags of saying, I'm not sure that the way we've been looking at this is accurate in a similar way to the way that we had been looking for the first 1600 years at passages like Psalm 93 and Joshua 10 about the place of the sun and the earth in the sky. So I, when I was 19, I came to the realization that I was gay, which was a terrifying uh, experience for me, probably the worst day of my life because even though I had already actually been studying this topic significantly and had actually already changed my mind about it through Bible studies I'd been doing with my Christian ministry on my college campus, I saw it as a justice issue that I wanted to advocate about for the sake of other people. It was not something that I was interested in experiencing myself because that, uh, that day completely upended the entire trajectory of my life. But 
because I care so much, because my relationship with God, my faith in Christ, and being a part of the body of Christ are so important to me, I decided that what I wanted to do was seek to open up a conversation, seek to have meaningful, respectful conversations with other Christians, helping people to understand the impact of their theological positions and interpretations, and to consider the experiences, lives, and testimonies of LGBT Christians. So in a nutshell, I think I have about five minutes left. I, I want to start with this, and I know we're going to get more into this, which I'm excited to do. But when I went back to scripture, I had a very specific question. It wasn't just, what are the references to same-sex behavior of any kind in the Bible? And are they positive or negative? There are six references, three in the Old Testament, three in the New Testament. They are all negative. I had a more specific question, which was, what does the Bible say about the type of same-sex relationships that I see many LGBT people and LGBT Christians living out? Committed, monogamous, covenantal same-sex relationships based on the same principles that my parents' marriage of 35 years has been based on. And when I did that, and when my parents went back with me to read these texts, they actually, both of them, ended up changing their minds. Because there are three, in the, three passages in the Old Testament. The first is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. Okay. And in that case, we have two angels who God has sent into the city of Sodom, disguised as men. All the men of the city of Sodom threaten to gang rape these angels. The angels blind them, thwarting their attack plan, and God then destroys the city with fire and brimstone. Originally, my dad had looked to that text as the main reason, in fact, why he thought that same-sex relationships were wrong. But once I had come out to him, he too was starting to ask more specific questions and realized, yes, this is a same-sex, this is at least a threatened act of same-sex behavior, but gang rape is worlds apart from you know, my son sitting in front of me and the type of monogamous covenantal relationship he would like to have one day. In Leviticus, there are two prohibitions of male same-sex intercourse in Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13. The primary question for Christians about these texts is simply what is the role of the Old Testament law in the lives of Christian believers? It's not always a cut and dry issue. We know from the New Testament, we know from Romans 10.4 that Christ is the end of the law. We know from Colossians that the law has been nailed um, to the cross. But that doesn't mean that the law doesn't matter anymore. The law, of course, still matters, but what is its applicability for us? It's not always a one-to-one -one applicability. Just because something was prohibited or required in the Old Testament law, therefore, that is consistent with a Christian ethic. Sometimes we see variation. Certainly, even within Leviticus 18 and 20, sex during a woman's menstrual period is prohibited as an abomination, but that's not widely regarded as a sin by most Christians today. So really, we need to look to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, we have three passages by the Apostle Paul. Romans 1, 26 to 27, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 1 Timothy 1, 10. I want to focus right now on Romans 1. In this text, Paul talks about people who knew the truth of God, were worshiping God, but turned away from God to worship idols. And as a result, God gave them over to a wide array of things. A debased mind, he says at the end, has 21 different vices. But before that, he says that God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In like manner, the men abandoned natural relations with women and became inflamed with lust for one another. They committed indecent acts with other men and received the due penalty for their error. I remember when I was talking with my dad about this text, I said, yes, this is clearly a very negative text. This is a condemnatory text. But Paul is also saying that these are people inflamed with their lust one for another. He goes on in Romans 1, 28 to, 20 to 32 to say that these people have no faithfulness and no love. And I said, That's, has, th that does not describe the type of relationship I would like to have. I want a relationship based on love and faithfulness and covenantal commitment in a way that reflects God's covenant keeping with us through Christ. As Ephesians talks about, marriage being a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church because it's fundamentally about covenantal self-giving. So, but, and so, and so my dad said, you know, well, that's true. This is about lustful behavior, but at the same time, Paul uses the language of natural and unnatural. And so for many Christians, they'll read that and say, even though this is specifically about lustful same-sex behavior, all same-sex relationships are wrong because they go against the natural created order of God as laid down in Genesis 1 and 2. What I have found to be important in thinking through that topic is 
seeing another passage written by Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, in which he uses the same words. In 1 Corinthians 11, 14, Paul uses the same Greek words, both for nature and for shame. The Greek word for nature, phusis, and the Greek word for shame, atomia. And he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 14, does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him, shame. But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. What's interesting about this is most Christians today regard Paul's uses of the term nature and shame or disgrace in this text as being culturally specific to the first century ancient Mediterranean world and their cultural norms about hair length. And that makes sense because in the Old Testament, Samson had long hair as a sign of his devotion to the Lord. So long hair in men, which was a requirement of the Nazarite vow, cannot always be something negative in men. People see that as a more culturally specific thing. And it's true, the Greek word for nature can have many meanings, and one of them can be more specific to customary practices of a particular society. My point, then, is if Paul is using those same Greek words in 1 Corinthians 11 in a way that is more culturally specific, we should at least consider the possibility that he's using them in a similar way in Romans 1. And in fact, the terms against nature in reference to same-sex behavior were common shorthand dating back to Plato's laws in the 4th century BC for same-sex relations. And it was based on, primarily, based on the fact that same-sex relations were seen to violate patriarchal gender norms in a society that just didn't, have, didn't just have different roles for men and women, but saw women as being fundamentally of less value to men. Time. Okay, so I'm sure we can talk about that more, um, <laughs> but I will just say I think it's important to look to the New Testament trajectory in terms of the relationship between men and women, the equality of women, how Jesus treats women, and how that should inform how we interpret texts like Romans 1 and the cultural specificity of terms like nature in those texts. Thank so you. with that, I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Matthew. So at this time, at this time we're going to transition into the open dialogue. And I'd like to start it out, well, because I'm the moderator, I have the power. Uh, with, uh, with just asking, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll toss a question over to Sean. And, uh, and then you guys can maybe go from there. So uh, I'll start my clock, and here we go. On your view, both of you gentlemen, uh, what's at stake here this evening? And I'd like to ask a question, what if you're wrong? Hmm. I think it's an easy answer. If I'm wrong, I need to change to Matthew's view. If he's wrong, I need to change to mine. <laughs> what's at stake are the teachings of Jesus. Are we going to follow it? Number one. Number two, what did he say? So let me ask a question back for you. In Matthew 7, your ex-Jesus that you use in this book, where did it go? Here it is, on my lap. How to talk about the Bible and LGBT inclusion. By the way, $10, $14 for shipping. Well, You're okay. killing me. <laughs> You're killing me. We nor there's normally an option for $2.75. I missed that USPS, one. But we've had some issues with that. We're working All right. on it. All right. All right. So... Consider it a donation. Let's stay on topic, gentlemen. So we will, we will. So your first argument, which I talked about, is citing Matthew 7, that because of experience, we need to go back and reconsider Scripture. Where does Jesus teach that we are to evaluate biblical teaching based on experience? Well, Jesus' teaching in Matthew 7 is specifically he's talking about false prophets or exactly. false teachers. I just think that that principle has a natural applicability beyond that because I've never seen a Christian teaching that destroyed people's lives that was a good okay, Christian so, teaching. Okay, so, so slow down. Right. This is not what Jesus taught. Jesus You're teaches saying, the principle. Jesus teaches a different principle. Jesus teaches good fruit is obedience and bad fruit is lack of obedience. That's what he said. If you're going beyond it, you're reading in a principle into Jesus that's not there in the text. Am I right? No, I just think we have a different interpretation of it. Okay, so why is my interpretation wrong then? Why is the interpretation saying you can evaluate teachings of Jesus based on somebody's experience? Why does the text say that I'm wrong in my interpretation? Because we both said we got to look at the words of Jesus, and I don't see him saying that. Matthew 7, Matthew 3, John 10... Where does the text say that? So describe to me again, refresh me on your argument here, about, so you're saying fruit, in your understanding of the text, is only about 
obedience and has nothing to do with what Galatians 5 calls the fruit of the Spirit? Uh, we can go to Galatians 5, but it's not just me. I have a ton of commentaries I pulled off. I couldn't find one that disagreed with me, not that I read all of them. So it's not my interpretation. The standard interpretation when you look in the context is Jesus is saying, you can judge a prophet by its fruit. Good fruit is when the prophet's message causes somebody to turn and repent. Bad fruit is lawlessness. The verses after that say that. In fact, John the Baptist gives the exact same phrase in Matthew 3, verses 7 through 10, when he's saying he's speaking about repentance, and then he says, a good fruit leads to repentance. That's the clear context. So why am I wrong on my exegesis of Matthew chapter 7? That's what I want to know, sticking strictly to the exegesis. Well, I just suppose it's a question of, does this principle have a broader applicability? And to me, that's a, it, I, I believe that it does. If you don't, that's fine. And I think there are other, you know, this is, to me, what I tried to do in the opening chapters of my book was offer what I saw as three different warrants for a reconsideration of this topic. So I do think that the harmful, destructive impact of the church's rejection of same-sex relationships is something that should matter to us. Of course, in, I it, agree 100%. It's something that should matter to us in asking whether we've read the text correctly, but it's not my only warrant for a reconsideration. And so if you disagree with my interpretation of Matthew 7, I mean, that's okay, that's fair. It's fair for you to disagree about that. But I also talk about, you know, this is, this is why I kind of put forward, um, I think there are multiple warrants. And another one... Okay, so slow down. Let, let me stick to this before okay. we go on. Because it's not just about interpretation. You have to point me back to the text and say why your interpretation better explains what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7. I don't disagree in principle. If we look at the lives of LG, LGBT people, and it can be proven that it's actually the biblical teaching itself that causes that suffering, which is something I wouldn't... Well, I would say the interpretation. That. Right. Okay, now I would agree in the interpretation. Then we should look at it. That's fine, but that's not a teaching that Scripture says. Jesus never said that anywhere in the Gospels. What he said is good fruit is repentance, bad fruit is disobedience. So it's not about somebody's experience. It's about the objective teaching, whether we obey it or not. So it's not an emotional or experience. It's a moral principle. So you're welcome to bring in that principle, but don't use Matthew 7 if Matthew 7 isn't supporting the thing that you're claiming that it does. That's my only pushback. If we're gonna care about the words of Jesus, we gotta go right back to the context and see what he said. So it seems to me you have two options. Either stop using the first example in the book about Matthew and say, this is a principle that Jesus didn't say, but I think it's a good idea, or show me why my exegesis is wrong. Well, I guess I don't understand why you don't consider the fruit of the Spirit to be good fruit. Well, let's go to Galatians 5. Sure. <laughs> so here's what's really interesting about Galatians chapter 5. Uh, where is this? Genesis, Exodus, Galatians. <laughs> <laughs> Galatians 5, verse 16, okay? So, by the way, we've moved out of Matthew. We've moved out of the Gospels. We're now into Paul. So not that it's not relevant, but in terms of exegesis, you start with the book itself, then you move to others like it, and then outside. So we've gone far on the rung of exegesis, so to speak. If you read 5.16, it says, but I, I say, walk by the Spirit, you not gratify the desires of the flesh. 5.16. So he's contrasting being filled with the Spirit mm -hmm. with the desires of the flesh. Skip down to verse 19. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, which is porneia, which would have been understood as a variety of sexual sins, including divorce, it would have been fornication, and it would have included homosexual behavior, impurity, sensuality, etc. That's the verse right before. Through 21, envy, drunkenness, orgies. This is verse 22 contrasting this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, etc. And then 24 comes back to it. It says, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So what is Paul saying? He's saying you have a choice to live in the spirit or you have a choice to live in the flesh. If you are living in the flesh, which involves sexual immorality, then you are not filled with the spirit. 
So sure, somebody who's not a, a, a Christian or what else can have, or a same-sex relationship, can have some of that kindness. I would never say that. I'm not saying that somebody in same-sex relationship doesn't have kindness or goodness within them. Please don't hear me saying that for a second. But Paul is saying, if you're involved in sexual immorality, then by definition, you are not living filled by the Spirit. So even when we go outside of Matthew and we go to Galatians, it says the same thing, that fruit of the Spirit is not somebody's experience. It's tied to obedience. Just if we stick to the text, Certainly love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are all things that we do experience, right? You wouldn't know sure. joy if you didn't experience joy. So I don't think we can completely extract this from people's personal experiences, but also your point about sexual immorality is true, but it also kind of just gets back to our fundamental disagreement because I don't think that all same-sex relationships constitute sexual immorality. I, you're right. Exactly. That's and so that's why I would be interested in understanding more about like do you would you agree with me that the bible does not talk about same-sex marriage specifically okay so can i come back to that Before okay we leave we, we leave the text <laughs> i'm not dismissing the question i think that I is the, the first, textual question i think i have the first 20 and then you have the last 20 right isn't that how yeah, it works that's fine. technically that is that how it's supposed to be wait who has what 20? well we didn't we didn't divide it that way oh i thought we did i'm sorry time. all right no. never mind Okay, on, on this text, let me just push back, then we'll come to okay. your question. I was like, okay. you don't want to answer my question, Sean. No, I, <laughs> not too quickly, okay? Okay. Yes, people experience love, joy, peace, and patience. I grant that. I would grant that people who are non-Christians can experience some of those things. Just because somebody has some of those characteristics doesn't mean that person is filled with the Spirit. Yes. So if we flip back and look at this, what Paul distinctly says, if you are engaged in sexual immorality, then that means you are not filled with the Spirit. Yes. So that seems to undermine this idea of judging a tree by its fruit with somebody's experience. If they're in disobedience, that's a bad root which results in bad fruit. I'm not going to rap, which means the tree itself. Is sorry, that a song? Root and root. Okay. Oh, okay. okay, so I lost, sorry. Do you, do you see the point? Yes, I just think you're kind of presupposing something that is a matter of disagreement, which is I don't think that being in a same-sex relationship in and of itself represents disobedience. You do, and so that's how, why you interpret it that way, but I don't. And so I think you're asking me to kind of follow a logic at a point where I can no longer follow it. And so that's why I think we actually, we, eventually we have to come back to talk more just specifically about same-sex relationships and the biblical text. Okay, so we can go back and we can talk about that. We can bring it in. But the question you would at least have to concede that the Bible doesn't teach. You evaluate something by its experience in somebody's life. It's repentance or non-repentance. Because it seems like we've taken a road and what we disagree over is whether or not sexual immorality includes monogamous same-sex relationships. Okay, we have to establish that that's not what's in mm -hmm. view, okay? But to get there, you've kind of agreed with me that Matthew actually is teaching that disobedience is bad fruit, right? Oh, you, just, you just don't think... Disobedience certainly is bad fruit. We just have a different opinion about what constitutes disobedience with this topic. Okay, then. Then you need to get rid of this example in your book because you just conceded my point. I, you can see the point that I'm not fruit, tracking with you. Okay, look. If the point in your book that you use, example number one, is that bad fruit is leading distinctly to unrepentance, okay? It's not somebody's experience read back into the text. Bad fruit is what leads to unrepentance and disobedience. Correct, are you with me? Are you with me? The bad fruit is what leads to disobedience. Because you just said sexual morality is not disobedience, I mean, I, I certainly agree with you about disobedience being bad fruit. I just think you have an overly narrow frame for saying that's all that bad fruit can mean. And, and I does, think where sometimes... Where does the text say that? I would get, go back again to Galatians. I think that's the clearest explication of the totality of what good fruit is for Christians and how we can know what good fruit is. Okay, so let's move on to your next. Okay, your next yeah, I just question. think we. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, we can 
I think we're beating this one to death. No, I would be, I would be interested in reading more but, about what you're coming from. I'm not sure I completely understand your okay, critique. Let me sum up but, and then you come back okay. to exactly what sexual morality is, okay? So your teaching is, what you've said distinctly, is that we judge a tree by its fruit, the experience in somebody's life of living out teaching. Correct. Is that right? That's one way. I would say that's important, but, okay. but I would qualify that and say it's not just how someone feels, because our feelings are too subjective, but it's but specifically what the Bible itself calls the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, Jesus isn't speaking about the fruit of the Spirit in this passage. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying bearing good fruit of repentance. Well, he doesn't so say you're reading of repentance that in, specifically. You're reading that in. He doesn't say it anywhere. So you're reading it in as well. If he I'm doesn't not, specifically I'm not say reading of in. repentance. I'm saying he's speaking about repentance. Clearly, lawlessness and obedience is what Jesus is saying. None of those are words that he's using in this text, though. Look at the verse right after it. 23, he says lawlessness is exactly what he says. Uses That's the word not the text I'm talking about. It's in the context. You can't just isolate a text out of its broader context. You have to look at exactly what Jesus is teaching. I don't know. I honestly do think that you are, ironically, reading a little bit into this text to say, because in other texts of Jesus or John the Baptist, you know, he's talking about lawlessness or disobedience, therefore that is all that good fruit can be. I don't, I don't see that specifically in verses 15 to 20. So if I'm guilty of reading other verses into it, I'm reading Matthew 7, the verses below, Matthew 3, and the Gospels. You're going to Galatians and bringing something in that is bookended by contrasting the flesh with the spirit and distinctly says, do not engage in sexual morality. So I'm not the one who's bringing it in, I'm reading it in its context. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. Now you push back a question a minute ago, let's talk about that. Okay. You're gonna push back and say, go yeah, ahead, do, you ask Do you it. acknowledge, I'm, I'm calling, do you agree with me or do you acknowledge that the specific topic of same-sex marriage is not something that is ever addressed in the Bible? No. I don't acknowledge that. Where is same-sex marriage, you know, where is there a single text that is specifically talking explicitly about same-sex marriage? Okay, so if the standard is explicitly mentioning same-sex marriage, yes. then I would agree with you. But even the Trinity isn't explicitly mentioned. It's based on the teachings of Scripture. That's a doctrine we adopt because it best explains what we know about the character of God. So of course he didn't mention same-sex marriage. There was no debate about this 500 years before the time of Jesus or 500 years after. The unanimous view was that any kind of same-sex relationships were wrong, right? But so of course it wasn't explicitly addressed, but the teachings of Jesus, Matthew 19, Genesis 1, sufficiently address it. Right, so what I argue, and I talked about this a little bit up there, is that I think that our, the understanding today of same-sex orientation as a, an exclusive, permanent sexual orientation is a new understanding akin to the way that the telescope changed our understanding of the solar system. I think it's a significantly new understanding because it affects how we understand the impact of a rejection of all same-sex relationships. Do you acknowledge or agree that the understanding of gay orientation is not something that was understood or talked about in the church until the mid 20th century? Um, William Loder, a gay-affirming New Testament scholar, would disagree with you, who's written a thousand pages on this in multiple books. In his book, The New Testament on Sexuality, says there was a basic sense of sexual orientation in that culture. Bernadette Bruton. That's actually wrote, not she quite talked what he about says. That. I have I, the quote, actually, right here, if you want me to pull it out. He says there's a basic sense of sexual orientation. Now, he says it's not perfectly he says analogous, it's not the same. but he says it's sufficient to be the same. But here's my question. I don't see why it matters. Now don't hear me saying, if I don't see why it matters, that I don't care about gay or lesbian people. If anybody hears me saying that, they're completely mishearing my point. That's not fair. Right. My whole point is Genesis 1, through Leviticus, through Romans 1, through 1 Corinthians 6, Matthew 19, a consistent pushback to this creation narrative that God has made male and female and has designed them to be in a monogamous, one flesh union for life. And the Bible never affirms a relationship outside of that. So you even said in your book, you said it right here, that 
if it's rooted in creation, then the idea of orientation or new scientific advances wouldn't change this if it's rooted in creation. Now, you disagree and say it's not rooted in creation. That's where I say that it is. So sexual orientation doesn't change the biblical teaching about God's design for men and women in the relationships of marriage. Right, well, here's why I think it, it matters. Because I think in your reading of Matthew 19, you kind of see an implicit rejection of same-sex marriage, right? I see an affirmation that God has designed marriage between one man and one woman in a committed relationship for life. And Jesus went out of his way to say that it's male and female. It quotes Genesis 1.27, he didn't have to, that marriage is a gendered institution. He points back to creation. Right, so you see that as an implicit rejection of same-sex marriage. It's an implicit rejection of any kind of sexual relationship outside of that one flesh union. Right, so the reason that I think it's important to, under, to acknowledge or understand that what we're talking about does differ significantly from what the church had been talking about prior to very recent generations is because I think ultimately it's anachronistic to say, what does the Bible say about same-sex marriage well, we'll go back to Matthew 19, and because Jesus says God created the male and female, therefore he's kind of implicitly <coughs> saying no to gay marriage. I think that's asking, I think that's trying to import a context that is alien to that text. And yes, I would agree with you. It is true. Marriage in the Bible is only ever talked about as heterosexual. In the New Testament, it becomes exclusively monogamous. The question that I raise is, we're talking about something that the Bible did not explicitly discuss. And so I think we have to look to the deeper principles of scripture's teachings on marriage and sexuality to ask whether there can be space, faithful space for committed monogamous covenantal same-sex relationships in, that is consistent with the core principles of scripture's teachings on marriage and sexuality or not. And the alternative, if there is not, as I mentioned, is that we would need to modify the historic Christian doctrine on celibacy which has understood celibacy as a spiritual vocation and a gift and not to be mandated on a whole class of people simply on account of who they are. If, if there can be no faithful space for same-sex marriage within the church, then we have to revisit the doctrine of celibacy and we would have to modify that historic Christian teaching because either way, okay. we are dealing with new information about same-sex orientation and we have to respond to that. We are, I see a, we're kind of at a fork in the road and we can respond to it in one of two ways either through modifying the Christian teaching on celibacy, and I can talk about why I don't think that that is the right way to go, or by modifying the historic Christian doctrine on marriage so that it could be inclusive of two men or two women, which I recognize as a significant shift, and so I understand how that can uh, produce okay. some anxiety so, for people. But I think that's why it matters that what we're talking about is not something that was specifically addressed in scripture, because yes, we need all of our beliefs to be grounded in scripture, but if we have a topic that was not specifically addressed in scripture, then we also have to be attentive and be conscientious and looking to what are the core principles here? Okay. And are, would this path or this path be most consonant with those core so, principles? So let me ask you this. Your whole argument is that the biblical writers were not aware of sexual orientation and the kind of same-sex relationships we have today. 20 minutes. Okay. I'd say that's a part of the argument. That's that we just talked about. Okay. Fair enough. So if God wanted to communicate transcendent cross-cultural guidelines and norms for sexual relationships, given that they weren't aware of it, how could God have done this? Because it seems like you're saying, tails I win, heads you lose. The biblical writers were not aware of it. They couldn't have addressed it. And since they didn't address it, therefore we have to consider that it's okay. No, so that's, how, not, what I, that's how, not what I'm saying. So though. how could, if God wanted to, communicate, and by the way, your argument kind of assumes that the scriptures are not inspired and God couldn't foresee this. No, no, I disagree with Because if that. he's God, of course he could foresee it. So distinctly, my question is, how could God have done a better job of communicating his design for marriage and sexuality, assuming they didn't have this information to talk about? I think the information was there, but I'll just grant you that. How could God have done a better job communicating that cross-culturally? Well, I think that's a bit of a tendentious framing of the question. Uh, but, so there are, there are a couple points that I want that's, to respond to. That's a big to. SAT word, by the way. Oh, 
I'd, I'd like you. a definition there too, actually. Tendentious, man. Um, <laughs> Jiminy. So, now I, I, I got a little lost after the second point, but do you want me to rephrase it? No, because you, you made two points that you were responding to. Oh, okay, here's the point, first thing. No, my argument is not because the biblical authors don't discuss it, therefore it's fine. That's not a particularly good argument because there are plenty of things that, you know, what, what do you want sure. to, internet pornography, right? That's obviously not discussed in the Bible because the internet didn't exist. Um, but that's why there are so many topics that aren't discussed in the Bible and we look to the, to the biblical teachings that are as relevant as possible. We look to core principles that we can find from scripture. And because Jesus says that we should not lust, you know, that tells us a lot about that topic of internet pornography. But, so it's not just that the Bible doesn't talk about same-sex marriage. It's that I think that the core principles of the biblical teaching on marriage, as we find in Jesus' t is teaching in Matthew 19, yes, of course the framing is heterosexual because same-sex marriage was not even on the radar screen of possibilities here. The conversation around gay people, gay Christians, that was not even within the bloodstream of the conversation. But the core principle that he's getting at, he's talking about how marriage is fundamentally about covenantal faithfulness. Okay, Jesus does not say that in Matthew 19. Well, I think he, he does. He does not say it's about fundamental <laughs> covenant. That's a part of it. He says it's about male and female. That's exactly what Jesus says. You can't skip over that and say it's about covenant. Now, I'm with you 100% that it's about covenant. So it's more than a gendered institution, but it's no less. Jesus points back to creation. And you said in your book, if God, if the text is teaching that God created us to operate in a certain way, male and female, then it is cross-cultural. And that's exactly what the scriptures did. So as far as scripturally, it's irrelevant, the topic of sexual orientation, which is highly debated on all sides of this issue. That topic can be debated, and we obviously won't go there right now. That'll take us aside. But my question is, how could Jesus have done this better I'm not sure you've answered that. If he wanted to communicate cross-culturally, what's better than pointing back to the beginning, this is how I made it to operate. It's still injunction today. Therefore, it yeah. transcends cultural changes. Do you think... Even more than like lusting would with internet pornography. Do you think the church has ever misinterpreted a teaching of Jesus? Of course. So in theory, then, you could say the same thing and say, well, if the church broadly misinterpreted teaching, then you could say, well, Jesus could have said it better, but I would never say that because that's just not, <laughs> it does not feel, um, I would more put the onus on the church for, well, we got it wrong, we are human, we okay, have human the, failings. The mere fact that the church has made mistakes in the past doesn't mean we're missing it on this issue. Right, but we were that trying to follow. suggest was that if, the basically, because the church has long held this based on how they interpreted scripture, in theory, scripture could have been written in a different way that uh, in order to be more affirming of same-sex marriage and therefore my position rests on a lack of inspiration no, I'm, of the I'm Bible. Not, I'm not making a tradition argument. I'm not making a tradition argument. Well, then I'm can saying you explain, let's look at Matthew 19. Right, but can you explain can again I, why you think that my argument rests on a lack of inspiration of the Bible? No, that point was simply, you, you were saying they weren't aware of sexual orientation at that time. But I'm saying if God wants to communicate something cross-culturally, he knew that this was coming in the future and could know that and address it and isn't bound by some scientific finding that of the is, day. That is true. But if that's how God wanted to work, then the church would never have gotten anything significant wrong. Because in theory, take an issue like slavery. It is understandable. It is awful, but it is understandable how pro-slavery Christians interpreted the Bible to support their position in defense of slavery. In theory, you could say, well, you know, Jesus never outright condemns slavery. He talks about slaves in some parables, he never outright condemns it. Now, I think everyone in this room would agree about what Jesus' position on slavery would be. This is not a contentious issue today, fortunately. But if you go back 200 or years, 150 years, Oh, that's right. Uh, if you go back 150 years, though, it's an incredibly controversial issue. And you could make the very same ar argument. A pro-slavery Christian could say, well, if Jesus was really against slavery, why didn't he condemn it? He had the chance. So I can't, it's, you know, it's not up to me. I don't know exactly how God always intends to operate. That's beyond my pay grade. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I do know that this has happened before. 
and that the church has gotten things wrong broadly. The church has gotten teachings of Jesus wrong, and I think we have to be open to that possibility without saying okay, therefore. Okay, now I'm open to it. Without saying therefore, the Bible is not inspired. That, so that's not my argument. That's not my argument. If you read the 2003 book, Princeton University Press by Rodney Stark, the definitive work on slavery, he says it didn't start in the 19th century, anti-slavery movement. Back in the early church, people were resisting and making arguments against slavery. It goes back to Aquinas and earlier in the Middle Ages. Although Aquinas was actually pro-slavery, but just with certain conditions. No, Rodney, Rodney Stark, I think, is right about this, about Aquinas critiquing it. His whole point is... He critiqued is, forms of slavery, but he did not condemn slavery categorically. In fact, there was no he Catholic He made pope, critiques distinctly of slavery. But of it, forms of it. it listen, was, there was no the Catholic, point is, what Stark argues, is that there's been a consistent voice, theologically based, condemning slavery. It's just that people didn't listen to him. That's totally different. I agree that some people were wrong and manipulated the scriptures to justify how they wanted to enslave people. But not of even intentionally manipulated. I think some people sincerely believed Whether it. Whether they believed it or not, they were mistaken. We can talk about when people were right or wrong about slavery and other issues. Fine, I can see people can be wrong about that. But here we're talking about Matthew 19. Jesus points back to the creation. He affirms God made them male and female. He affirms the Genesis account that one man and one woman in a committed relationship for life is normative. So the possibility that we've been wrong on other issues has nothing to do with us being wrong on this one. You've got to show me distinctly in the text why I'm wrong and why I think Jesus' view is wrong. That's the question. Where in Matthew 19 am I missing it? Okay, I think the difference is I read his statement at the beginning of Matthew about God made the male and female as part of the framing and how he is framing his response to the question. At the end, you know, so Jesus, and there are varying interpretations on this, but I think in general many people interpret it to say that Jesus makes at least one exception for divorce in the case of infidelity, but he does not make an exception in the case of infertility, which is actually really interesting and countercultural in his context in which many people would have seen if a woman, and of course they always would have blamed the woman even if it wasn't, um, if, if that wasn't fair, that if the woman was unable to get pregnant, then of course the man should be able to discard her and try again because it's all about having heirs, that sort of thing, and that's not Jesus' view of marriage. So that's why I was saying I think Jesus elevates the covenantal commitment foundation of marriage above, for instance, the ability to procreate. So that was, that was my initial Ten minutes. point. Um, okay, so he never discounts the creation ordinance from Genesis 1. I agree with you that in the Old Testament, the building of God's people was through procreation. You write this in your book. Right. Gets to the New Testament, now the family of God is understood differently. Right. But Jesus still keeps marriage as an institution, even in the church age, which is why I quoted Luke 20, 33-34, when he says, when we die, we won't no longer need marriage because we'll live forever, we won't need to procreate. So the institution of marriage is gone. So you're totally right that he is elevating covenant, but he's not getting rid of the creation mandate, which includes procreation as a heart of marriage, which assumes there would be male and female. So where in the text am I missing that? I think you're... I mean, I, I largely agree with what you're saying in that, yes, Jesus is hearkening back to Genesis 1 and 2. Jesus is talking about marriage as, you know, in a heterosexual framework because certainly in his context, there is no other framework to even talk about it within. But we're asking How do you know that's what motivated Jesus? How do you know that's what motivated Jesus, why he talked about sex in that manner? Because that's not what he says. He talks about it because that's how Genesis describes it. You're assuming that he's importing something from his culture when Jesus is pointing back to Genesis. So how do you know that's what was motivating Jesus to just describe it because that was the only framework that they had? How do you know that? Well, likewise, I would think that you're assuming that he is making some particular point about exactly how, for instance, gender complementarity between male and female functions in a way that then has a direct word to speak against same-sex marriage. And I think that there's a bit of a leap of logic in that. And okay, that's so let's, why I let's think- let's talk about that. Why am I wrong 
about the complementarity that Jesus is assuming based on Genesis. Tell me why I'm wrong, scripturally speaking, that Jesus doesn't assume complementarity. Yeah, I think I meant something a little bit different by that. What I mean is that people will often argue that men and women are complementary in a unique way that means that marriage can only be between men and women. And so I like to unpack that statement to ask what people exactly are getting at when they're talking about the complementarity of male and female. Yes, of course, male and female complement each other, but do they complement each other in a way that can be shown biblically to be universally and exclusively normative for marriage relationships? Let's and so talk we, about it. we could talk about you know, the Let's role of procreation it. in okay. marriage. So some people will argue that because marriage must be procreative, or it must be biologically procreative, and, or at least have the possibility of that, and therefore same-sex marriage cannot fit within a Christian vision of marriage. Whereas I would look at that and say, even in the Old Testament, when procreation was of paramount importance to how God was building his kingdom people, you have marriages that are infertile, like between Hannah and Elkanah, or between Abraham and Sarah, that sure. are not regarded as invalid on that basis. And then when you look to the New Testament... Can we talk about that and then sure. go to the New Testament? So it's not actually having the kids that makes the marriage valid. It's the kind of union, the one flesh union, that takes a man and a woman that by its nature is oriented towards procreation. So they're infertile. But see, that's an assumption. Infer it's, not an, it's not an assumption. It is an assumption. It's, it's taught in the text. Infertility is the lack of something that is supposed to be there. So a chair's not infertile because it's not the kind of thing that can reproduce. A man and woman in a marriage are infertile because something's broken and not operating the way that it is supposed to. But if a man and woman come together, as it says in Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2, have this permanent leave the father and mother, cling to the spouse, and then create their own household, which is oriented towards having kids, you see that pattern there, even if the kids don't result, it's the kind of union that makes it a one flesh union. So it's not actually the kid that makes it a valid marriage. So I agree with you about Elkanah and the other example. But that doesn't undermine the one flesh union as being necessary for marriage. That's what Genesis teaches in the first two chapters yes, of the Bible. Yes, I think marriage does involve a one flesh union in a unique way as compared to other relationships. My question, once again, and this is why I do think it's very important for biblical interpretation that we recognize that we're talking about something that is not specifically discussed in scripture and that has not explicitly been discussed and debated in the church until recent decades. Because the question that we have to ask then is not, is a one flesh, Bible, is a one flesh union always talked about in the Bible in heterosexual terms? Yes, it is. Five minutes. The question is, is what is going on at the core of what makes a one flesh union one flesh union? Is that something that could be lived out in a same sex relationship? And so if what is at the core of a same sex, of a one flesh union, is the capacity for biological procreation, then it would not be. But what I see, and you talked about this a little bit with a reference to Laban and the way in which flesh, being a, flesh and bone are talked about as a kinship bond. Obviously marriage is kinship plus. <laughs> It's not, you know, it's not just the same as being an uncle, but there's something there in terms of Adam and Eve through forming a one flesh bond or creating a new primary kinship bond that is also sexual, that involves the total giving of oneself, of one's life, of in the modern day, of one's finances, also of one's physical self, of one's sure. body. And so the one flesh union is a sexual union, but I don't see where in scripture a one flesh union, yes, the question is not, is it always talked about in heterosexual terms, because it is. But we are talking about something that the Bible does not talk about, specifically. So then we have to ask, well, is there anything that is universally and exclusively normative in how the Bible talks about one flesh unions that makes it so that it could not apply to same-sex couples? And I think it's insufficient to just say, well, it never applies it to same-sex couples, because of course it doesn't. We're talking about something the Bible wasn't talking about. So I, I would need to see something going beyond just saying, well, it always, you know, it never actually applies it to them. Well, what's the reason why we could not faithfully make that okay, application? So two questions. You're right, where it says in 224, where it says, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh can refer to David and the people of Israel or others. But then in the text, it says, this is in 223, this is the last bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. 
She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, there's a transition, and it moves specifically. A man leaves his father and mother, holds fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Yes. So there's a difference between being of the same flesh and being one flesh. Now, does this text explicitly describe the anatomical parts? Of course not. And but actually, no biblical here's text why. does. Two minutes. It doesn't have to. It's obvious, Matthew. It's obvious. If you read the text, it's clear that a man and a woman line them up together. There's a certain fitting that takes place that doesn't with the same gender. I think it's that, not possible. Yeah, I think that that argument. And especially, let me finish. And especially when it's in the context of a mother and a father populating and filling the earth, when the term is connecto, which is his opposite, the text is clear. It's clear. Not to mention Romans 1 says they exchanged function, which krasis in the Greek refers specifically to function that somebody was designed for. It's in the text. Yeah. You have to read something else. I would just else say, though, I think, see it. I think that that argument is, I mean, you actually moved away from a biblical argument, and you moved to just saying, just line up a naked man and woman and see how the parts fit. No, that's, that's you, not fair. That's, that's what you what, said. Uh, no, it's not fair. I just walk through one and two and explain the obvious intuitive nature of what the Bible's teaching. But I you, didn't import something onto but it. But you said that it's one obvious reading it. based on anatomy, right? The anatomy is a part of what makes it obvious. Yes, I would agree with that. And I think that that's not something. So you're saying, well, the Bible doesn't ever specifically say that but it doesn't say it because it's obvious. I think that that is something that is much more likely to seem obvious to someone who is heterosexual. And so I think we just need to be careful about how we make assumptions about what's obvious that correspond much more to some people's experience than to others. I think so, obviousness has to do with being human and sexual orientation has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with the obviousness of male and female and the fittedness within this text to populate and fulfill the earth. Time. It can only be done with a male and female. So I, guess I do have a thought about that, but I know we need. Unfortunately, um, it's time for parents with your cherubs. This is always how it goes. For everyone who gets good, you know, you guys have to go, uh, you have to go get your kids. Um, feel free to, uh, if you want to come stand in the back or even come sit with your kids, they can come in here and you can talk. Um, and then we're going to roll into a time of question and answer for about 30 minutes. We're about 13 minutes behind schedule, which ain't, which ain't that bad. And um, I have to say, we have never received this many questions. <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever, ever, ever. I love it. <laughs> so I'm, uh, so, <laughs> so I'm going to, uh, you know what, I'm going to read the questions, if that's okay with you guys. All of them? I'm going to read all. Well, we got 622 questions. No, you I'm, did not. I'm playing. I'm a pastor. I inflate numbers. So, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to come over here and just so I can stand up and stretch. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the questions to you and save Kaylee the work. Oh, do you, Kaylee, are you ready to go? Okay, good. And uh, save Kaylee the work. How are we doing this? Is it for one of us? We both I'm going to alternate questions because there's okay. the, some people that did definitely direct questions at one another. And uh, I, I would love to, um, you know, the, one of the questions here strikes, uh, strikes home. It's for both of you guys. So we'll start on neutral ground here. And I love the question, can a homosexual be a member of the church? Now, we're bleeding over into the pastoral part of it, but I think that it has a significant relevance, uh, at least significant enough for us to chat w about today. So, so Matthew, do you want to answer that one first? Sure. Um, well, first of all, as on a pastoral note then, uh, I would just make a point that if, if you want to use, I, I know a lot of people just use the language that they've heard, but in the overwhelming majority of instances, using the, it's talking about somebody as a homosexual is not going to be received as a very respectful way to be talking about them because that's almost how no one self-identifies. So, you know, if you want to be using your sexual language, just saying like a gay person, or even just asking someone, you know, how they identify and, and using that language, you know, just probably uh, just pastoral tip. 
But yeah, I, I would say I think a gay person absolutely can be a member of the church. I think the disagreement, you know, and the people will say, well, is the gay person celibate? Is the gay person in a monogamous same-sex relationship? And some people may have differences of opinion based on, but I think, I don't know if very many people would really disagree, say a gay person simply, simply for being gay, for having a same-sex orientation can't be a member of the church. I think if, same -sex, if a gay person is in a committed monogamous same-sex relationship, because I think that that can be consistent with the core biblical teachings about marriage being about self-giving and covenant keeping with one's spouse to reflect God's covenant with us, then I obviously would, have, would think that that makes a lot of sense too, uh, but I'll let Sean share his perspective. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the clarification about homosexual and gay. That's, imp that's important to be rightly sensitive. I think the church should be a place where everybody is welcome to come and hear about Jesus. The church needs to be a place everybody can come and be welcome about Jesus. I've heard stories of people coming not just on this issue, but other issues, been treated different, looked at differently. Last I checked, Jesus went to sinners. He reached to people who were sick and invited them to have his forgiveness and medicine that would lead to transformation. So I hope that if you're a pastor, go to a church, whatever it is, not just gay people, whatever, would feel welcome to come. Now, of course, when you have a church, there's going to be standards and teachings that the church has on a host of issues related to behavior, not orientation. I'm not talking about orientation or attraction when it comes to behavior. So churches need to be consistent if they're going to follow the teachings of Jesus on issues like divorce. If a church says, well, somebody who's gay, they can't come, but we're just going to allow people who are not biblically, who, who are divorced but not biblically justified to come, that's inconsistent. The church needs to be consistent in what we do. I think that's good, and um, I appreciate both of those answers. Um, there's, one, there's one here that, that I've actually wondered, too, and it's for, it's for Sean, and it says, Dr. McDowell, are my seemingly inherent lustly desires to leave the bounds of my marriage any different from one's seeming, no, this could go both to both of you, seemingly inherent uh, homosexuality, why or why not? Did that make sense? I think I got it. Are you, is, so, it, is so, this is somebody who's married, who's lusting after somebody of the opposite sex and wants to leave their marriage? Is that any different from somebody who I think is that's attracted to said. somebody of the same sex? I think that's what I guess said. it depends on what you mean by different. Socially, we probably treat people differently and are probably not consistent on that. How about according to the scriptures um, and the results of the behavior? So are the, are the results, according to scripture, are the um, results of one leaving the bounds of their marriage the same as one having a, um, a homosexual relationship? No. I think they're both outside of what Jesus taught. Matthew 19 says the same thing. The two shall become one and do not separate what God put together. That's explicit. So if Christians turn around and condemn homosexual behavior, but are okay with that, then shame on us for being inconsistent. But for sake of consistency, I think Jesus condemned all sorts of immoral sexual behavior outside of the one man, one woman, one flesh for a lifetime marriage union. Okay. Matthew, would you like to add anything or address that question? Um, I mean, I don't know if you need, I need to respond to every question, but I would say at, there are two levels to this. One is, practically speaking, is it a similar thing? And this is important for pastoral responses to people. And pa practically speaking, it is not very similar uh, because cheating on your spouse is not the same thing as a gay person who is seeking out the very kind of relationship for them that the married person who wants to cheat already has. And so that's an important distinction just to know I, I think everybody would naturally have, should naturally have more compassion for uh, somebody who simply, whether you agree that they should or not, someone who simply wants to have a, you know, one monogamous committed relationship versus somebody who's married and wants to cheat on their spouse. And so I think how that affects our compassion, how we respond to people, there's an important distinction. And then theologically, because I think that there can be a space, and I see this space less as being in the original creation, going back to your point, Sean, and more about being in the new creation. I think there is a space, I think it is possible for same-sex desire 
to be redeemed if it is ordered toward covenantal sexuality in the same way that it can be for heterosexual people. And so that's why it's, you know, I would agree with you about Genesis 1 and 2 in terms of obviously there are no same-sex relationships in Genesis 1 and 2, but I don't think it's a question of it's either part of the original creation or it's part of the fall. I think there's a third option for Christians that things can be part of the new creation because God says that Eden is good, it is very good, but also something is not good in Eden. I think we're moving to the new Eden in which all of the potential of the original Eden is going to be fulfilled and that's why we have changes like barren women and eunuchs who were excluded will be included and we see that in the New Testament. And so that's where I think there is faithful space for same-sex relationships, with, which is in the new creation and that would be theologically why I don't think they're the same. Okay, the, uh, the next question here is, is for you, Matthew. And it's worded as uh, like this. The, the Bible does impose celibacy on a large class of Christians. In fact, it's a, a group even larger than the group being considered a homosexual community. It's anybody who is, uh, is unmarried, anybody who is, um, oh gosh, it just changed on me. No! It's, um, it's all unmarried men, all unmarried women in the world. Um, why do we overlook this group? It's, or it seems, it seems the, the questioner is saying, why did you overlook this group? Uh, and include the, the homosexuals in that, it's, it's bad being uh, celibate for them, but not for people who are left unmarried. Right, and I would say I think there is an important distinction for a couple reasons. One, I want to root myself as firmly as possible in the Christian tradition. So, I have always believed, I always learned growing up that sex should be for marriage. And that's how I've always wanted to live my life. So when I realized that I was gay, I wanted to hold on to those same values. So I am single. If I never meet someone and where things click and where, you know, and where we end up getting married, if I live till I'm 90 and I'm single, then I believe that I'm called to celibacy in that as being a Christian but my experience of being celibate would be so different and so much healthier because I don't believe that every romantic attraction or desire I ever experience is a, is a source of, or it should be a source of conviction, should be a source of shame. It is not good for people to regard every simple attraction. I'm not talking about lustful fantasizing. I just mean noticing that someone is beautiful in a way that straight men notice beautiful women in a way that straight women notice beautiful men and in a way that gay men notice beautiful men. Just noticing someone's beauty if you believe that there is no possible outlet for your sexuality to be expressed in a holy way, then every attraction you ever experience is an occasion for conviction. And that leads people to have an immense burden of shame that they are carrying because something about them that they cannot change is kind of a... Is, is always there reminding them of their unique disordered sexuality, not disordered in the way everyone's is. And so for me, I think my celibacy, even if I live till 90 a celibate, will be so much healthier and more consistent with the historic Christian understanding and the biblical understanding of celibacy because it wouldn't be something I'm choosing because I think that my sexuality has no possible good expression. It would be something I'm choosing because I did not have the relational context for that proper expression. Okay. Sean, would you like to? Uh, sure. So last night I called Chris Yuan, who's coming to speak here in a couple weeks. Christopher Yuan, former atheist, became a Christian. Uh, Same-sex attraction, lives a celibate. He would describe single life. And I asked him this. I said, as a single person, do you feel like the teaching that your sexuality, as a single person with same-sex attraction, is completely disordered puts such a burden and crushing on you. And here's what he said. And I asked him because he has an experience with this that, that I don't. And he said two things. He said, actually, if we take what the Bible says seriously, it's heterosexuals who should have the crushing burden of shame because the Bible on a number count actually condemns heterosexual sin a lot more than it does homosexual sin. He said, second, everybody's sexuality is disordered everybody's sexuality is disordered. And he's right. We just got a text from somebody. I don't know how, if somebody was really in this situation thinking about leaving your wife. If you are, don't. That question earlier. <laughs> but there's an example of disorder. 
In fact, Ed Shaw, who's a same-sex attracted pastor in the UK, he said in the people he counsels, he experiences much more loneliness among married couples than he does singles. Friends, Romans 3 says all of us are broken. All of us. I mean, you read Romans 3, and I read that and go, oh my goodness, every thought, like venoms and ass. I mean, it's not like I read that to my kids when I put them to sleep at night. Hey, son, remember Romans 3. <laughs> Actually, I might. You know why? Because I want to remind them of the power of God's grace. Mm. All of us are deeply broken. I don't look at you, Matthew, as any more broken than me. I don't. Anybody who's here watching this who has same-sex attraction, I do not look at you with any judgment in that fashion because I know my heart way too well, and I cling to grace. And if I can leave a quote, just read a quote related to this by Daniel Matson, who wrote a book called Why I Don't Call Myself Gay. He's a single uh, Catholic man. And he describes some of the pain of being single in this book. He describes it as bone crushing. It's tough at times. He says, I find that the church is teaching that my inclinations toward men are objectively disordered. Safeguards me from living in a state of unreality by protecting me from following the path where my disordered inclinations lead to chaos and unhappiness. That's good. You know, I'm trying to sort through these in... Uh Matthew, man, you got a lot of questions to answer. <laughs> Holy smoke. <laughs> you know, they're mostly. But, um, but here, here's one for Sean, you know, and, and I think it's for Sean. They didn't designate this, and I'm going to try to get through this as best I can. Uh-oh. Uh, regarding the, the marriage model reference, why do we gloss over the immediate uh, deviation from this model by nearly all the patriarchs in polygamous relationships? I told you it was heavy. Which are even acknowledged in the Tor- Torah and Deuteronomy and lawful. Why is there a hyper-focus on two adults who desire to be in a committed, monogamous relationship who happen to be of the same sex? How is this a consistent view when well, we uplift polygamous the, heroes the, the, and condemn The reason sexes? that it's focused on this, look, I didn't share my story. I've been married to my high school sweetheart 17 years. I have three kids. If you had told me five years ago I'd be in a conversation with Matthew and talking about this issue, I would have laughed and be like, you got the wrong McDowell. But getting asked this question so much, seeing it divide the church, seeing the hurt, the pain, the rancor that often happens, I felt like I've got to study and I've got to get this issue right. So why did I study this issue and not polygamy? Because there's not a big campaign to reform the church from inside to adopt polygamy. In 2014, I went to your conference and I told you this, I went to the Reformation Project that Matthew put on in Washington, D.C. There was, I don't know, about 400 people there. And I was treated totally graciously with open arms. And I really appreciated that. It could have been easy for people. And I wasn't, like, in case somebody thinks, I wasn't, like, picketing with signs or something like that. I went just to listen and to meet people and to hear their stories. And I actually told my wife, I'm like, if they're right, I better change my theology. I better change it. So I went to listen and hear, but Matthew's leading a Reformation project to get the church to change its theology. There's not a Reformation project, as far as I'm aware, to get the church to adopt polygamy. That's the reason why I've addressed this. That's it. Now, with that said, if the church is inconsistent on it, again, shame on us. If anything, studying this issue has made me realize and ask myself some deep questions, man, am I looking at this, this issue through a lens that I don't, my own greed, or my lust, or my, like, it's made me ask some tough questions. So when you look at the Bible and the issue of polygamy, it's not explicitly denied. But what you have is you have a one flesh union taught in Genesis, and clearly when you're married to multiple people, you can't have a one flesh union. You can't give your whole self to somebody. That's why when you read through the Bible, it's as if the Bible doesn't have to condemn it. Look at David. He has multiple wives. One of, his do- one of his sons rapes one of his daughters. One of his sons murders one of his other son. One of his sons wants to steal his throne. It's like the scripture saying with him and Jacob, his two wives are fighting. Go ahead and live this way, but you are going to see 
the natural results of moving away from my design for marriage. So can God use people who are still broken and disobey? Sure, if he didn't, he wouldn't get anything done. <laughs> Myself included. But that's why I talk about this issue, uh -oh. not that I one. No, Eric. Why did he redeem those people? And he, in virtually every patriarch, in the entire Hebrew Bible, was a polygamist. And we gloss over those heroes, the actions of those heroes that we uplift. But yet, we, we can't acknowledge the validity of something that Matthew is presenting as a Christian. Okay, so, so let's not make okay. a habit of this. You, yeah, I understand no, your voice here. Aaron, I know, I know Aaron. That's fine. So... The difference is, when you look in the Old Testament, yes, they had serious faults. And I actually point it out all the time. I don't gloss over it. <laughs> I give talks to students about, don't be like David. Be Goliath like David. But when it comes to Bathsheba, big mistake. Don't be like him. Be like Jacob when it comes to here, but don't be like him there. So there's a difference in the sense of God specifically choosing and ordaining them despite their sinfulness. We don't have that same explicit prophetic call today. But with that said, I have acknowledged that there's a ton that I've learned from Matthew. We disagree on this in debate, and I hope we can continue to have these conversations. There's not a lot of people that will push back like this and don't mind it or get offended. People don't. Like, this is important. Today, people are afraid to disagree. You've made me learn a ton about use the word gay, not homosexual. I make a note. I go, okay, I can be more sensitive. So I'm not totally glossing off him. I hope this relationship continues, but I don't think it's fitting with Scripture. And if there was a polygamist up here making the same argument, I would do exactly the same thing. Yeah, and do you, do you want to address that question, or should I move on to it? No, I'm happy to have I've, you. I have a good question here that I think brings us back to, uh, back to the topic at hand. Um, you know, what does the Bible teach about homosexuality? So you know, the, question, the questioner says this, Matthew, you said that you do not think all same-sex relationship, relationships constitute sin. How are you justifying that position biblically? Is there a positive case you can make from the scriptures? Right. So some people will, I've heard some people kind of seek to find some equivalent of like a modern day same-sex relationship in the biblical text and then use that as a warrant. I, I don't think that that's a good idea primarily because the types of same-sex relationships we're talking about today are different in significant respects. Uh, primarily monogamous covenantal relationships between equal status partners, relationships that are premised on mutuality, not hierarchy. And so there are no examples of relationships like this in the biblical text. That's why we have to look to the core principles of scriptural teachings about marriage and sexuality and ultimately ask, is what is at the essence and the core of the Bible's teaching on marriage is that something that can be fulfilled and lived out by same-sex couples or not? And because I see the essence of that as covenantal self-giving in a relationship that reflects God's covenantal self-giving of us, then I think same-sex couples can live that out. Okay. Would you like to respond to uh, that? Sure. I think, I think, again, that's going to be the heart of where Matthew and I disagree. I don't see anywhere in Scripture where issues like mutuality, covenant, and monogamy trump, no pun intended, what the scripture teaches about God's design for marriage. I don't see why that would trump anything that the Bible teaches is wrong. There's a, there's a related question that, that adds something onto it, and I'd like to just kind of explore this maybe a little bit further, because this is actually the crux of what we were talking about tonight, right? And... One person here pointed out that uh, it seems to me, or it seems to the, the, the questioner, that when talking about uh, same-sex marriage, uh, we uh, use a principle of stripping gender out of it and saying it's a, it's the, a marriage relationship doesn't have to be man-woman. That's not the point of the text. And they're asking for a justification on that as well. Hmm. Right. Does that make sense? I think so, and I think this is... I mean, somewhat, yeah, somewhat related it's to related. the last question, because that is the question. The question is, is gender difference, specifically between men and women, is that essential to marriage for it to be, for it to fulfill the core purposes of marriage that are taught in the Bible? And I think if 
it were essential, then it should be possible to clearly articulate the reason why. So if the reason is procreative capacity, then we should not just point to biblical texts that have a high view of procreation, but we should be able to point to biblical teachings that clearly say that couples without the capacity for biological procreation cannot have a valid marriage on that basis. And I don't think we see that in scripture. In fact, I think we see the opposite, especially in the New Testament. Paul talks about, he encourages married couples to have sex often so that Satan does not tempt them. He doesn't talk about the, the sex you have must be open to procreation. Song of Songs is kind of an ode to um, eroticism in many ways and does not specifically tie sexual behavior to openness to procreation in order for it to be moral. Uh, Jesus puts more of an emphasis in talk, and when he's talking about ex an exception clause to divorce. The emphasis is not infertility or issues related to procreation, but rather infidelity. So I just don't see, well, and you, you know, we could pick other issues like that as well that people might bring, but I think if gender is essential to Christian marriage, then it should be possible to clearly, substantively articulate why, have a reason, and follow that through the entire biblical text. And with procreation, for instance, I don't see that, and I see the opposite of that in how the Bible talks about the necessity or lack thereof of procreative capacity for a marriage to be a valid marriage. But yes, as to the questioner, that is indeed the question, the question that, uh, that I'm interested in exploring. Awesome. Uh, Sean? Yeah. So the question is, is there a justification for stripping gender? And I think you're right when you said, is gender essential? Let me read you Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Amen. I could read it again, folks. <laughs> and I, don't, I, don't, I didn't mean it in that sense. I don't, I'm not trying to be sarcastic. If you read it straightforward... Gender is an essential part of being human, so much so that even in Jesus' resurrected body, he still has his gender. We will have gender into eternity, is what the church has classically taught. So what Matthew says, there's a text should say that couples can't procreate, can't get married. The question is not the result of procreation. It's the kind of one flesh union from which procreation results. That is taught in Genesis 2. It's affirmed all through scripture. Matthew 19, Mark 10, Ephesians chapter 5, that this one flesh union is at the heart of marriage. Marriage is about much more than that, but it is about no less. So why does this male-female matter? Because as you look in the scriptures, there's dichotomy from Genesis 1 all the way through the end. I was just reading an article by N.T. Wright this afternoon talking about marriage. And he says, you look in Genesis chapter 1, it's day and night, it's land and sea, it's plants and animals, male and female. They come together as one. You see this affirmed consistently through the scriptures. And that's why the bride of Christ is compared with this issue of marriage. That there's a similarity, but there's a difference. So the pattern, I see it all the way through scripture, is that gendered is an essential part of what it means to be human. And even though some couples cannot procreate, they cannot have children, they can still enter into that one flesh union, which God has designed between one man and one woman in a committed one flesh relationship for a lifetime. That's what the text teaches. And, and it's with that that we have to end our time of question and answer. Um, it's been phenomenal and we're gonna move into transition into our time of closing statements. Uh, three minutes each, starting with Mr. Vines. All right. Oops, oh, I think my microphone just fell out. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to Sean. Thank you to John. I really appreciate it. And again, in a nutshell, I just think that one, a couple takeaways that I'd like you to have tonight. I think it matters tremendously that the topic that we're talking about specifically, the question of gay Christians, LGBT Christians,
and their committed monogamous relationships is not a topic that the church has discussed, has addressed, not just in scripture, but for the totality of the Christian tradition until the mid 20th century. We are faced with a new situation, with new understandings and new information akin to what happened after the invention of the telescope, and we have to respond to that in some way, either by mandating celibacy for all gay Christians, which requires a modification of the biblical teaching on celibacy and the historic Christian tradition's doctrine on celibacy in a way that undermines the basic essence of that teaching, that celibacy is a free gift, is a gift that is freely chosen and a spiritual vocation that complements marriage. People should not be celibate because they think sex is bad and wrong and categorically sinful, but rather celibacy is something that is affirmed alongside marriage and sex within marriage. Both things that are affirmed, not one that is pursued because the other is wrong. To tell all gay Christians you must be single and celibate is actually to say you must be single and celibate because for you, sex and marriage would be categorically wrong. That is inconsistent with the biblical teaching about marriage and celibacy specifically and with the historic Christian teaching on it. Or instead, we could take another path, which is to ask if in fact the the essence of the biblical teaching on marriage, rooting it in covenantal self-giving, is something that same-sex couples can live out. And I would invite you and ask you, as the last thing I'll say, to please seek out relationship with LGBT people, and specifically LGBT Christians. Regardless of your beliefs, there has been so much pain and so much harm that has been done through the church's lack of understanding and lack of compassion. And no matter what you believe, please seek out those relationships with openness, with humility, and with a willingness to learn new things. And please pay attention to seeing how your beliefs impact people. What is the effect on people's lives? Is it giving life? Is it bearing the fruit of the Spirit, or is it not? And I would just ask you to stay in those relationships and really seek to show the love of Christ to the LGBT community. So with that, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Sean. Sean, it's, uh, you have three minutes. Whoa. Mine did that as well. Can you hold the clock for me? Nope. No, man, you're a slave driver. <laughs> Trying to make up time. My boss is watching. Thank you, John. Thank you, Matthew, for having the courage to come and have this conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you did as well. My position is this. What Jesus teaches matters. Jesus is the only sinless person who ever lived. His humanity tells us he understands our hurt and his pain. And his divinity tells us his words have authority. And what Jesus says in the scriptures is that if you want to understand how God designed sex and marriage to be, go back and look how God designed it to be. Not just gay relationships, any relationship sexual outside of that norm is disobeying what Jesus taught how we are supposed to live. I mourn with you, and I hope you know this from the depth of my heart, Matthew. I've spent a lot of time listening to my LGBT friends, trying to understand, trying to be compassionate, crying with them. And you're right, we as a church need to do a better job at this. The pastoral question is big. We need to educate ourselves, have uncomfortable conversations, and get this issue right. But getting this issue right is not twisting the teachings of Jesus. It's aligning our lives with what Jesus taught about marriage being one man and one woman, becoming one flesh for one lifetime. Now Matthew's talked about celibacy some and how difficult that can be, and I know it can be difficult for people, but let me just end with a couple quotes from some single celibate same-sex attracted Christians. Pastor Ed Shaw says, I know there are many today who think it is a great tragedy to die a virgin, but I hope I will, because I know that I will not have lost out on anything too significant. And you know what? Neither did Jesus. He was a single man and experienced as a male the depth of experience and joy and contentment as God designed him to be. One minute. Another example would be Sam Albury. He's another same-sex attracted celibate pastor in the UK. He said this, he said, I may not have the security and constancy of a family unit, 
what one friend calls life's shock absorbers. But when it comes to intimacy, I'm very rich indeed. I think as a church, maybe sometimes we have held up sex and marriage on a higher pedestal. But when this life is done, sex and marriage are finished. But friendship continues forever. The more I look at this issue, I think if the church was truly building relationships, truly loving people with the intimacy that David had with Jonathan, Jonathan, we would not find ourselves where we are theologically today. Time. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Matthew. <laughs> Likewise. Well done. Thanks for being here. And, uh, and that concludes our evening. Can we give them a real round of applause, guys? <laughs>